As you might have seen, there's a bunch of turning points and what seem to be contradictions but really have to do with ripeness and at a ripe moment it's like a pivot and you go in the opposite direction. And in prior increment, the idea was, you know, with contradictions in Bible or seeming contradictions which are really boundary lines. And then you have the issue of contradictions, therefore, in life, where it seems like, for example, that you're operating on a horizontal with people, but really it should be the opposite. It should be vertical to God first, and then, as it were, an upside-down V comes f from you to God and from God to the person. So if you're always doing as unto the Lord, then it doesn't have anything to do with the person you're facing horizontally doesn't have anything to do with the life or the life circumstance that you have horizontally. So whether you're picking flowers or you have cancer, it's supposed to be as unto the Lord. That doesn't mean you don't feel anything and it doesn't mean there's no struggle. There's a constant struggle. But the way to resolve the struggle is the opposite contradictory to what it seems like should be the solution, which is horizontal. And that's a habit that you have to get into. That's how the Lord was thinking. That's why he was able to pay for sins on the cross, because his whole thought pattern was vertical. Matthew 4.4 4 always occurring. Live, Learn and live on Bible. Learn not what comes out of, you know, your body, but toward God. And the thing that's really important about that verse in Matthew 4, 4 is that in Greek, like in many other languages, the thing that's mentioned last gets the most important. Ends up being stressed. And that's the way it's set up to. Not merely bread, but... And of course, then that means it's more stressed. Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God and he actually was using those words as he spoke them so that he wouldn't imagine bread. Because he's God, if he merely imagined bread, it would have come to exist out of those stones. That's what Satan was tempting him to do. Now, therefore, in your own life, you're constantly going to have a struggle. There are constantly going to be contradictions. And in your own life, you end up learning how to live if you keep practicing, practicing, practicing like piano. How to think vertically first. That's what he's doing in Matthew 4.4. 4. Now once you start to do that, you become a really rare bird. You're thinking exactly in the opposite process that as a normal human being you would go. Sooner or later, people are going to notice that. Sooner or later, they're going to end up thinking that you're aloof, you're distant, you're this, you're that, you're the other thing. And the really odd thing about it is that this whole thought process of vertical first is pretty much the way you need to think in order to become a professional in life. And I had alluded to that before in the last increment. If you want to make any real money in life, you have to learn to think in principle first. You spend a lot of time alone. You spend a lot of extra time training for a particular occupation or job or specialty. And you end up being alone. And that causes a certain amount of um, upset amongst people with whom, you know, you normally have a relationship and they feel like they're being slighted. Okay. What it amounts to, and I sort of talked about that too, is a kind of divorce. You're more or less divorcing yourself from um, having a, a intimate relationship. I mean, you're not really divorcing yourself from an intimate relationship, but intimate relationships tend to be time-consuming. And especially with certain people who have a very shallow approach to life, their whole idea of love um, is measured in terms of how much time you spend with them. 
And even if all you're doing is sitting there and you have absolutely nothing in common and all you talk about is the weather and colors, that, that to them they're so shallow that passes for love. And the more you grow in the spiritual life, the more vertical you become in your thought pattern. And the more cold you seem to be to others because you don't have in common with them this thought pattern. And they're busy looking for horizontal time to spend with you and you're progressively looking for time to spend away from them. Because, you know, that horizontal thought pattern is going to end up becoming detectable as shallow. And you get to where you have pretty much nothing in common with them. And anything you say, they don't understand. And anything they say, you sort of understand, but you don't want to understand. This is the, the problem, and it exists in many other forms besides this root form of difference between, you know, thinking toward God and thinking toward people. It's, it's, a, it's a primary problem in life, you know, the lower classes are very um, prurient. You know, everything to them is body, 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 and shallow and superficial and childish and all those things interest them and that's why we have so many shoot 'em up movies because it's you know appealing to the lowest common denominator and that's not to say that everybody in a class is you know low-minded some people are poor by choice and some people are poor because they have to be but the majority are poor because they don't want the amount of hard work it takes to go farther. They like the relationships they got. They aren't willing to work harder um, to advance themselves because then they have to spend less time with the people they want to spend time with. And that's the way it goes. And then they blame everybody else who makes it and they don't. Because they're basically jealous. All right. That does. That's the majority of people who don't have money. Is why. Okay. The same thing is true in the spiritual life. And on the inside, you're seeking the spiritual life because ideally you want God. And it just morphs into this vertical pattern of thinking, and only later do you realize that that was the intended spiritual path all along. Because if you're going to be a king, you have to think vertically. Because all of your subjects, who are going to be those straws feeding off you, they only know how to think horizontally. Their throughput is so small that they're only going to be able to get a drop of doctrine a day per day for eternity. That's all they can absorb. Because their souls are so small. But you're going to love doing it because your vertical thinking is so big and it helps you share more in God and knowing what it's like for God to be God and you're a little God yourself because you have to be one in order for them to be able to feed off you because they don't want to feed off God directly. They chose the horizontal. So they got to get what they get through you. Trickle down. True trickle down. God is all about trickle-down economics, not because he wants it to be that way, but because that's what people want. That's why trickle-down is the only kind of economics that actually works. And everybody can't stand it because it's so slow. Yeah, well, this is why it's so slow, if you're not going to tamper with freedom. And from time immemorial, people have been trying to tamper with freedom. It never works. We will never learn that lesson. It never works. And even in heaven, in eternity, it's going to be that way. Okay. So that's a contradiction. An internal contradiction. There will always be a few rich and many poor. Because that's what they want. Now the same thing is true on the inside. That's what the body wants. It wants what it wants. That's what Romans 8 is about. It's the dichotomy between soul and body. Dichotomy between the spiritual life and the soul life. The soul was made to have a relationship with God. But it's got to have a body to walk around in. So it's got a certain affinity for body tastes. 
And the big problem in original sin was to choose the horizontal over the vertical. And man's been doing that ever since. So the affinity for the body ends up determining your life more than it ought to. And the, hor and the vertical either doesn't get developed at all or gets developed very little. At least you get saved. And the key is to have a nice, huge vertical pipeline. Okay, well, in order to go from horizontal to vertical and go from a straw-sized throughput to a huge highway-type size throughput, there are a lot of contradictions in yourself that have to be overcome. This is the most important thing to, to realize about it, is that when you're young, because you're a straw in orientation and ability to absorb, you're given do's and don'ts. The Bible is written pretty much on a school child level. As far as a school child would be able to read a large amounts of it. Beneath that school child level, as you're older, you'll be able to see more nuance. Especially in the original languages that you can't see in the English. And therefore you can grow up more. But... If you always look at it shallowly, the way it's taught in pulpits, then that's all you're ever going to know. Similarly, if all you're interested in knowing is the shallow stuff, then that's all you're ever going to know. And all of your contradictions and your problems are going to be between your body and your body, and one and a half seconds with God, and then, you know, 20 minutes with your body, and one and a half seconds with God, and you really just don't ever know Him. Now, if you want to get a larger than a straw throughput vertically, then you got to deal with the contradictions in yourself. And as I was saying before, there is some major t childish thing that holds a person back. There's some kind of adherence that you never grew out of as a kid. My pastor liked to call that spiritual hang-ups. Then spiritual maturity are the final things to go. And you'll find out what they are. There'll be certain particular topics or issues or experiences that you keep going through them. The first remark about it is you keep going through them again and again and again. And it takes a long time before you're even aware that that's what's going on. Then it takes a longer time to decide, well, you want to do something about this and that it's holding you back in the spiritual life. And then it takes a longer time to go through the layers, layers of contradictions, of counter, um, what do you want to call it, counter orientations, counter answers, things that you'd rather use as your way of dealing with the situation. Because a lot of these hang-ups got started in childhood. And as you're learning Bible doctrine, there's so many other areas and so many other topics and experiences to go through. You sort of just let those go. And so now you've grown up in all these other areas, but that one or two or three or four spiritual hang-ups, they always stayed retarded. And toward the very end of your spiritual life, the last phase is what I should say, because the end could take a long time. The last phase of your spiritual life, those are basically going to be what's holding you back. And they're going to be, you know, front and center issues. They keep on playing over and over and over. Like with David, for example. It was, you know, he was called. That's the way it starts out in 1 Kings 1. What you're being told there is that he's having a spiritual problem. You find out what that spiritual problem is in 1 Chronicles 22. Basically what happened was is that God told David, Okay, it's time for you to retire. Solomon should take over. Solomon was the guy God appointed. And David agreed with that, but he kept on playing footsie with it. So what he said, Ah, oh, my son Solomon. I love my son Solomon Shlomo. I love him, but, you know, he's a little bit too young to be a king. But God had appointed him to step down and give Solomon 
the throne. David didn't really want to do that. Oh, he's a little young already, so I think, you know, I'll put in one hand, and I won't exactly, you know, just do this a little. Okay, I'm stepping down, but I'm not really stepping down. Well, what that did to the kingdom was... It made them not trust or have faith in Solomon as the takeover ruler. Even though David announced that God had appointed him king and all the rest of it, because David had a lot of sons at that point, it was a real issue, which won. So they didn't really put their allegiance with Solomon because David wasn't doing that. So what happens is David gets sick. And that's how First Kings opens. Okay. And the, the story why is in First Chronicles 22 through the next seven chapters. Okay. And so, basically, you know, David is doing his thing. And, well, it's not all, well, yeah, seven chapters, seven years. Yeah, right. So David's doing his thing, and basically what happens during that time, um, for the last seven years of his life, is he's designing the temple service, and that's what the seven chapters in Chronicles are about, from the First Chronicles 22 through 29. He's designing the temple service, he's designing the temple, he's designing the priestly service, the, whole, the songs, the whole bit. Okay, well... During that time, I'm not really sure when, I want to say maybe it was mid, middle through it. Some of the other sons decide, well, you know what, the kingdom is not really supporting Solomon, let's make a bid to replace him. During which, of course, David's getting sick, so he's lying in bed being warmed by the Shulamite. No, maybe it's not the Shulamite woman, I'm getting that mixed up with Son of Solomon. But some woman, I forget her name. And then he finally recovers. But before he recovered, you know, she had been keeping him warm. All right. So as far as anybody knew, you know, she was sleeping with him. But I, if I remember the text right, the Bible makes it kind of clear that he wasn't having sex. In other words, he wasn't capable. Okay, so he was in a lot of trouble with God. Now, my, my memory could be wrong on that. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. But anyway, the point is that he recovered afterwards because Bathsheba and Nathan go into where he is sick. And say, you better get up and get going and, you know, because they're going to take the, the kingdom away from Solomon. So then he had, you know, Solomon gets his second crowning. It might have been as late as the seventh year, but I don't think so. But it could have been. I'm not really sure of the timing. The point is that a civil war occurred. Because David was cattywampus with God. Okay. So similarly, when you're cattywampus with God on a particular topic, there's a civil war going on in your body. Part of you is, you know, orienting to God and it's really good and really mature and all the rest of it. And part of you is still two years old and retarded. It becomes front and center and real critical to find out what those parts are. They occur in everybody. It holds every everybody has his own Achilles heel and it, you know holds him back. That was the one for David in Paul's case. It was Romans nine. He was all you know worried about the Jews. And my pastor spent a lot of time on that. He called it Paul's fall. And that's in 1992 Spiritual Dynamics starting at, I want to say, Lesson 1521 and then going on for about another 90 lessons. 1541, sorry. And in Paul's case, his Achilles heel was he couldn't bear it that God had appointed him apostle of the Gentiles. He wanted to be the apostle of the Jews, but that was Peter's job, which is hysterical because the Catholics reverse it. 
If they were going to make anybody Pope, it should have been Paul. He was actually in Rome. He was ordered to Rome by God. Actually had the house there. You know, the whole bit. We got that whole story very well laid out in Scripture. But... Paul couldn't just... Oh, he just couldn't get past it. This is where he was childish. That was where he grew up. That's where all of his friends were. He was a student under Gamaliel. He was really good friends with James. It was old home week. He wanted to go back and bring the Macedonian gift. And that's what the book of Acts records in Acts, you know, chapter 21 and 22. 22 is where Paul confesses his hickey, his own spiritual hickey. He wanted to go back to the Jews and witness to them. Yeah, it almost got him killed. So if it can happen to Paul, it can happen to you and me and Will. So what is my spiritual hang-up? Well, I've been talking through my own. It's this whole kingship thing. Since I was a little girl. I've been told and told and told and told how superior, how this, how bad, 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 bad I am. And I equate all that with being alone. I equate all that with... I'm going to start crying, so I guess it's true. I equate all that with being um, ostracized. I equate all that with having nobody that I can talk to that can even understand what I say. And yeah, those are all compliments. And they leave you very much alone. Oh, you're so smart. Oh, you're so this. Oh, you're so that. Uh, honey, I'd trade all that away in a minute just to be able to have some fellowship with somebody. So can you imagine what it was like for Christ? See? Use the hang-up. So how do you get over the hang-up? It'll have some kind of tie to Christ. So you turn it into a vertical. Because I am crying now. Alright? This is my problem. This is my hang-up. You'll have yours. Count on it. Hebrews 4. Thank you, Dad. He was tempted in every way as we are yet without sin. Okay, so whatever is bothering you, that hit him. Turn it into a vertical. Whatever's bothering you that's holding you back or really just just flattens you. That happened to him. Turn it into a vertical. Oh, my problem that I'm having that hurts so bad. He had that happen to him. Now you have fellowship. Because isn't that what we all are looking for? When we're suffering... It all boils down to you feel so alone. You feel so small. You feel so ugly or so bad or so rejected. Ish machovot udua holi. Isaiah 53.3. I'd like to translate that. The heartbreak man. Well knowing grief. Ish makovot. Ish, man. Makovot. Full of griefs. Wudua. Knowing. Holy grief. Heartbreak, man. Well knowing grief. They translate it. Acquainted. And I'm sure they're trying to be poetic understatement. I don't like that. Ish makovot. The heartbreak man. The do a holy, well knowing, heartbreaking. Actually, holy means lovesick grief. You know, like the story of Tamar who got raped. That was one of David's sons, too. It was lovesick grief. Oh, if you could just have Tamar come in and administer to me while I'm sick. And then as soon as she comes in, he rapes her. Lovesick. Well, that's kind of what this is. Yeah, oh, whoop de doo You're smarter than everybody around you. Yeah, and you can't have a decent conversation. 
they want to talk about blue and white thread. You want to talk about physics? And you you try, you'll simple it down, you'll dumb it down as much as you can, and they'll look at you and they'll smile and you can just see the words going in one ear and out the other. It's even worse when you want to talk about God. Nothing separates people faster. You want to talk about something about God? It is so rare to find somebody who actually even understands the words you're using. And you want to fall all over yourself like a little puppy dog. Oh, you know what the word Jesus Christ means? Oh, oh, oh. Because you've been starving for so long for conversation. Or whatever your interest is. But you're too different. You're too separated. Everybody around you, they want to talk about something else. So you feel isolated. You feel rejected. You feel all kinds of things. It hurts. Well, how did it feel for him? He's the God man. And you would think, well, see, he's powerful. He can have whatever he wants. No. It's worse. Here you have all the power on earth and all the power in heaven. But what do you want? You want... To be with your creation. But what does your creation want? Not to be with you. And that's kind of what prompted this audio. Was before I turned this on. I was, as usual, hanging over my kitchen counter. I don't know why the kitchen seems to be so productive. And I was saying to God, you know, why do I avoid you? I'm busy doing this, I'm busy doing that, I'm busy doing the other thing, and the truth of the matter is I'm avoiding you. What's wrong with me? Why am I avoiding you? And frankly, after 27 minutes of talking, I don't know the answer. But there's something. So you're going to have that hang up too. Your first hang up is going to be this whole loneliness thing with people. Because the more you grow in doctrine, the more lonely you're going to become. There's nothing around it. And it helps you understand what it was like for Christ. Okay? That's what it's for. I mean, that's what God can use it for if you go vertical with it. That's the first thing. But the second thing is just as tough. Okay? The second thing is, you find yourself avoiding him. It can take some really obvious yet subtle turns, like you're reluctant to go to Bible class. Whether your Bible class is a tape recorder, or hitting the button on your computer to listen to some recorded sermon. Or whether it's a physical going to Bible class. And when you go and when you're supposed to listen, you sort of tune out. And this happens off and on in the beginning anyway because as a child your span of attention is short. But after your span of attention is no longer short and you start doing a lot, it means that there's something bothering you. That seeing God or talking to God or thinking about God directly toward Him... It reminds you of whatever it is that's bothering you. It's like a problem in marriage or with other relationships in life. When you got something going on between you and another person that's not comfortable, you start avoiding the person. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the person who's like the problem. It could just be that something in the person reminds you of a problem. Like a lot of times, you know, a couple will have a kid. The kid dies. Then all of a sudden the wife can't stand to look at the husband anymore. The husband can't stand to look at the wife anymore. Not because there's anything wrong with the husband or the wife. But because the kid is dead and looking at that other person reminds you of the kid who's dead. And you can't bear that reminder constantly in your face. So you start to look for divorce or you start to look to drink or you start to look to your garden club or you start to look to TV. Anything to help you avoid 
So the trick is, well, what's bothering me about God that I'm avoiding Him? That's another contradiction. And you can see the oppositeness. Here it is. You you really do believe. You really are learning. You really can say you know the Bible and all the rest of that stuff. But yet you're avoiding him. Well, why know the Bible then? What's the point? There's no point to learning and living on Bible if it's not to be with him. Okay, so why don't I want to be with him? If I'm lonely especially... And the more you grow on Bible, the more lonely you're going to be. So why don't I want to be with him? And the same thing applies to stuff that you avoid. <laughs> what is the problem? That That's like having a clogged pipe. What's clogging the pipe? Why is it there? And here's the kicker about that. Once you find out the cause of the clog, invariably the reason will be... I ought to have that problem. This is the odd thing about it. We always think, no, oh, I have a problem with God. I have a problem doing the right thing. Something's wrong with me. No, the thing that's wrong is that you're calling it wrong. That sounds kind of weird. What was David's problem in giving up Solomon? God said so. He even did it. <laughs> but shouldn't he have a problem doing that? Would he be a normal human if he didn't? Here's Solomon, young and inexperienced. Yes, he was. But God said, shouldn't Christ have a problem with paying for sins on the cross? He said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, when he's on it. That's in Psalm 22, I think it's verse 6. He said, before he went, Don't let this cup pass from me. Shouldn't he think that way? Shouldn't he not want to go? See, too often in the Christian life, we're, say, we're assuming the things that we don't like, that we're bad people because we don't like those things. What is to like about those things? That's the clog. The clog is that we think we're supposed to like it. It's not likable. Was Abraham supposed to really enjoy killing his son? No. The fact is that he didn't. The fact is he didn't want to. And the fact also was that if God said so, he was going to do it. That doesn't mean he wanted to. You get the difference? You don't like it. It's not likable. If you have a disease of cancer, there's nothing pleasant or good about that. But you go through it anyway because God wants it. He has a will for it. You believe it. You use doctrine. And it hurts. And it's a struggle. And there's always this temptation to feel guilty because you don't like it. But see, guilt isn't going to make it go away. And there's no need to be guilty because you're not supposed to like it. So there's the problem of a hickey that you're not admitting. It's in your old life from a long time ago. There's a problem of not wanting to talk to God, and this is usually why. Because there's something you really don't want to face that you really don't like. And you think you're supposed to like it, but you don't. And so you don't want to look at God because that's going to make you realize that you're not doing the thing that you don't like that you think you're supposed to like. Okay, but you're not supposed to like it. It's not likable to go to a cross. It's not likable to have cancer. It's not likable to put somebody else on the throne after you've had power for 40 years. And you know that that person is, in fact, young and experienced. It's not likable that you know God is saying do this thing that you don't want to do. There's no reason why you should like that. 
There's no reason, therefore, to feel guilty that you don't. But we do feel guilty. We, Whenever we're in a situation with something we don't want or we don't like or we find repugnant or fearful or something, there's an, a certain amount of guilt, temptation. That's like, well, you should do this. And the implication isn't that you should do it. It's that you should like it as if God wants you to like what's bad. That's not what he wants. There is never a command in scripture, thou shalt enjoy suffering. God's out to turn suffering into enjoyment as a result of going through it. And that's evidenced everywhere. When you exercise, there's no happiness in that. Until after you've done it enough and enough and enough. And then the payoff comes. After. After. God designed it that way. And at some point, you get tired of pretending you like it. And you just admit, you know what, I got to do this thing. Then you start to like become at peace with it. You still don't like it, and you're never going to like it. But you get used to it being bad. You get used to it being something you don't want to do. You come to peace with the fact you don't like it. You also come to peace with the fact that, you know, here's why I got to do it anyhow. And you're really glad when it's over every time. But the more often you face the thing you don't want, and you admit the fact you don't want, this is a lot like 1 John 1 9. I hate this dad, I hate this dad, I hate this dad, I hate this dad. Yeah, but you're doing it, aren't you? And you're keeping the vertical connection. And basically it's like, I hate this, and yes, it's hateable. This is something I ought to hate. And I don't, you know, you can hate something and yet you do it anyway. I hate to clean. I hate to have to move my body around at all. I, I've got so many things I want to study. I don't want to move my body around at all. But I got one of those bodies that if I don't exercise five, six, seven hours a day, I can just call it quits. It's not like a normal body that only needs like a half hour a day of exercise. So why did God saddle me with that? So I would learn how to do something I don't like. And for the longest time I thought, well, I'm supposed to like it. I don't like it. I'm never going to like it. And I don't have to. Now, in something else in your life is something like that. There's something you know you got to do, and you can't stand it, but you think, oh, I'm supposed to like this at the back of your mind. No, you're not. So those are the three contradictions in your own life. Some kind of childish thing you don't like that you won't face. And it's sort of evidenced indirectly or directly by the fact that you're having a problem like talking to God all the time or looking at God or talking to him and studying his word especially you'll you know you'll be doing a bunch of things that got his name on it but not him and the third thing and this will be the reason partly of it too is that there's something you're avoiding confronting because you think you're supposed to like it when you confront it and you don't have to like it there's not the cross was not a likable thing. David giving up his kingship was not a likable thing. First of all, it was hard for him to want it in the first place. He was very content just to be a shepherd. But then he had to go and mess with, you know, all the politics and people. And there was no end of trouble, but he finally got, you know, where he fell in love with it. And now he's got to give it up. That's how God does it. He takes you where you don't want to go, and then you you stay there, stay there, stay there until now you want to stay there. Then he takes you away from it, puts you somewhere else you don't want to go. That's what maturation is. You do or you don't do because of the intrinsic value of the thing, and that's the, the fourth thing I wanted to cover here, the fourth contradiction. 
is that you do and you don't do because of the intrinsic value of the thing. There is a point in time when the training wheels come off. For most Christians, they will never know that day. There is a point in time when you are not doing what you do because you're supposed to. You're doing it because of the intrinsic value. In other words, daddy, in the beginning, well, you, you got to eat your peas and carrots or you don't get to have dessert. At some point, the peas and the carrots are going to be on the plate and the dessert's going to be right there too. And nobody's going to say anything if you eat the dessert and ignore the peas and carrots. Because you're old enough now, you should know what to do first for the benefit of what the peas got in them and the benefit of the carrots in them because your stomach might be full so you won't be able to eat dessert. So do the good thing first. The intrinsic value of peas and carrots versus dessert. And you'll be, you know, you eat the dessert first and you have no more room now for the peas and the carrots? Okay. So now you just cheated yourself with the nutrition. There comes a time when it's no longer right to do a thing because you're supposed to. That's the killer. That looks like it's immoral and totally antithetical, but this is where, again, you got to turn. A sort of contradiction, but it's internal in the sense that for you, this is the issue. For you, it turns. In other words, you know, they got the Ten Commandments, for example. At some point, those Ten Commandments don't apply to you anymore. It's not that they're not good and right and true. But it actually can be immoral to obey the Ten Commandments if you're doing it for the wrong reason. And the wrong reason is a childish reason. Well, God says I'm supposed to thou shalt not kill. If that's why you don't kill when you're an adult, then you actually disobeyed that commandment. You should not want to kill because of the intrinsic value of not killing. Not because God says so. You're actually spitting on him at that point. And that's the biggest fault in Christianity. And so whatever we do properly apprehend is the do's and don'ts. We're doing them because they're do's and don'ts and we have zero appreciation of their intrinsic value. So that's why people backslide. Honey, you don't drink gasoline simply because someone tells you not to drink it, do you? You don't drink it because, ooh, that's going to that's gonna hurt. You're thinking about the damage it'll do to you if you do it more than you're thinking about somebody telling you it's the right thing not to do. Right? When you're a child and you don't know how bad gasoline is, well, mommy says don't drink gasoline. At some point in your life, you smell gasoline. It's like, ooh, yuck, I never want to drink that. And you associate the smell and the, what you begin to understand is the poison of it. So that you're not even tempted to drink gasoline. Not because somebody tells you you shouldn't do it. But because of the intrinsics of what would happen if you did do it. Well, that's the same thing for scripture. And that's why the training wheels are taken off. And that's why you, you can go to a cross and know you don't like it. But he went to the cross, not because he was supposed to, not because dad told him to, but because he believed in the intrinsic value of what he was doing. That's maturation. That's resolving the contradiction. Because I don't think there's a greater contradiction on earth or heaven that you can talk about besides other than the cross. He made him, what was it? He made him who knew no sin, comma, sin. Can you get a greater contradiction than that? As a substitute for us, so we would become the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5.21, quoted in the same order as the Greek words are written. There's no greater contradiction than that. Our sins lacerate him. Isaiah 53 5. Our sins lacerate him. Javelin stabs, really. 
And Father was supposed to do that because why? See, you can't go by rules. These are the commands and you're supposed to do this. Uh, Father did it because he wanted to. Not because he's supposed to. What rule, by what standard of what morality can anybody say that Father was supposed to hit Christ with our sins? None. In fact, you're a typical atheist, and rightly so, is going to say, well, that's, that's cruel. Christ didn't do anything wrong. Why should he get hit with our sins? This whole story's got to be bupkis, flying spaghetti monster. That's that's true. Mature love, however, says, my son wants to pour himself out for me and I want to give him what he wants so no matter how much it hurts me to lacerate him with the sins of other people, I'm going to do it. Now, what human would do that? That's what Romans 5 is all about. Well, somebody might dare to die for somebody's good, but while we're yet sinners, Christ dies as a substitute for us? Romans 5, 8? Huh? See, that's not about do's and don'ts. That's mature love wanting an outlet. He wanted the outlet. He wanted to pour himself out for Father. And what would be the way to do that? Considering he's God. Man. What's the, what, what pours him out the most? That goes way beyond morality, okay? Morality is all about do's and don'ts. You do this and I do that. And then you give me my gold star and my paycheck. Blah, 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 blah. There's no love there. Love isn't about a paycheck. Love wants to pay. That's totally antithetical. That's a total contradiction. See the point? So in the final stage of your spiritual life, besides your internal contradiction, the maybe being cattywampus and talking with God, and then having this sort of like blockage about, well, I'm supposed to like this thing. That's a supposed to problem. That's also bespeaks immaturity. At which point you finally say, you know what? No, I don't. I want to do this thing not because I like it or not because there's anything enjoyable about it, but because, and then you have your own reasons. And it's related to the intrinsics about what you're doing. That's why I wanted to go across. Does it mean that you enjoy it? No. Does it mean that you like it? No. Does it mean that you want to do it because of what its value is? Yes. Now, its value, this is the last part, the five, the profit, its value isn't really doing anything for you. What did the cross do for Christ? What did our sins lacerating him do for him? Not a blessed thing. What did our sins lacerating him do for Father? Not a blessed thing. So then why would he value doing it? Because he wanted that expression. He did want us and he did love us. But the first thing he wanted was to be able to pay. Even though dad didn't need the payment, the Quran's real important about that. The Quran says that all the time. Oh, Allah doesn't have any partners. No, but he wanted to make some. I don't know why the, why the Muslims are so dumb about that. Yeah, Allah doesn't have any partners. Maybe he wants to make some. Because uh, if Allah is just stuck with inferior creation all the time, where's the fun in that for him? And that's why you know for sure Quran is from Satan. Because only Satan would mock that. 
Satan wants to be top dog, king of the mountain, put God down, be alone. Why? To him, that he, he's only happy if he's alone. He's only happy if he's superior to everybody else. I don't understand that at all. Where's the happiness in being superior? Yeah, well, God's asking the same question. Where's the happiness in being superior? Yes, I'm God. Yes, I have no partners. So why don't I make some? If I'm om omnipotent, I can make partners just as good as me. Yeah, 2 Corinthians 5.21. And he wants to do it that way instead of just bing. He wants to make it hard on himself. Pay for sins. Doesn't have to. It's not needed. But it's juridically valid, isn't it? And who's it juridically valid for? This is the intrinsics now. you got to really think about this. Who is it? Who needs to have those sins paid for? We do. God is God. He doesn't need nothing. Christ is Christ. He doesn't need nothing. In his humanity, he wanted to pay. Father for sins. With his thinking on the cross. And my badly pronounced Hebrew of Isaiah 53.11. He wanted to pour himself out as an expression of love for Father. And he wanted it to actually be, you know, valid. Now, that payment, therefore, applies to us when we believe in Christ. Anyone who believes gets it, because he paid Father for every human born. Therefore, anybody can believe and be saved. First John 2, 2. Okay, so you and I are the ones who need to know he paid Father, so why? So we won't be so torn up that we can't enjoy a life with him. Have you ever stopped to think about that? If your sins couldn't be paid for, heaven would be hell to you. If God just, okay, you're in heaven anyway. How could you stand to be there? Where did you get paid, Dad? How can you stand and look at me? Do you know how many marriages break up because of the perceived... Uh, what do you want to call it? Divergence of quality in one partner versus another. One guy's too rich and the girl's too poor. Or the girl's too rich and the guy's too poor. Or the guy's too smart and the girl's too dumb. Or the girl's too smart and the guy's too dumb. Or one comes from one culture that's too different from another culture. You know? Divergence. God's so high and we're so low. We need to know. He got paid. We need to know that the payment was, you know, what do you want to call it? Right. Enough. And that's really what why it's a gospel, why it's good news. Good news. You don't have to worry. God got paid. We need him to pay. That's the intrinsic of it. We need him to pay. We need to know that the payment was made. Okay? It's, it's like, I don't know. You inherit a bunch of money. And, um... You think, well, I should do something with this. And let's pretend that it's so much that there's nothing you could do with it. Anything. You know, do whatever you want. Buy a whole country. Doesn't matter. You can't ever spend it. 
you're going to start to feel real guilty and awful after a while. Because you're going to get into a big psychological funk about why you get it and somebody else doesn't. And you're going to start to feel really guilty. Well, the guilt has been taken away. Now, in the eternal state, it's going to be analogous to that between the kingdom and the, the king. The kingdom is going to be constantly relieved that the king has the knowledge they were supposed to get. And this is the scariest part of all for me. Is that basically what God's trying to do, and I say trying only because, it, you know, if you don't want it, you're not going to have it happen. But Christ's soul had to be big enough to, pay, to you know, unite with his deity. All right, for the eternal state, and therefore bigger than all of creation, and that's pretty much said in the first chapter of Hebrews, specifically um, when it's talking about you know he didn't take on the nature of an angel, okay? Because he didn't, because he went lower, the divergence is greater. The what they would call the multiplier effect, or the pivot, or the you know um, the leverage. Is high enough that he could pay for all the angels' sins too, because he went lower. All right, someday I'll try to cover that. He was better, but the point is, is that by going lower like that, then he is able to pay for our sins, and it is enough. Okay, so he had to become, as it were, the size of all creation in quality to compensate for what we didn't grow up to be. You know, sin is a shortfall, but the other shortfall is, you know, you didn't grow up as big as God designed you to be. But He did. So because He did, then it's okay you didn't. And that's the basic part of it, is each one of us is a little piece of Him, and in aggregate, represent Him, Sea of Glass, Revelation 4.1, and therefore, each one of our kingdoms, we're like the, the share, that's Isaiah 53, 12. We're the share of him. And then the kingdoms, the number of people in it, we're like the, their aggregate. And therefore, they can be comfortable knowing. They can be comfortable knowing that, as it were, the dividends of Christ that should have been earned the Holy Spirit managed to deposit an X number of kings. So it all got paid. So now we can be happy in eternity because the bill got paid. And so it's okay if some of us are rich and some of us are poor. In aggregate, the bill got paid. So we're all going to be happy, some a little, some a lot. But all those contradictions, they synergize. So it's a combination of your own internal hang-ups and the contradictions. That was the theme of this audio. Plus the effect of going through those contradictions and hang-ups to the opposite side. To where you get to be king-sized and then everybody who didn't get through their hang-ups. You're, as it were, their repository. And yet it's drip, drip, drip for them forever but you get to be the one they drip from. And everybody's going to want to know him then, so what do you care if it's low, slow, and constant? It's always about him. Think about it.